so you heard who these amazing panelists are. I'm going to let them tell you, a start by asking them to tell you a little bit about their organizations, because you may not know much about them, and I apologize if you know everything. But Kevin, I'll start with you, if you don't mind. Sure, thank you. Uh, so Laborers International Union of North America is, uh, represents uh, now over 500,000. We're about 530,000. I would say we've- Soon grown. a million. Yeah, that's right. The general president's laid out a goal. Uh, we've been increasing a lot in the last couple of years with the infrastructure investment. Construction laborers are one of about 14 crafts on, on construction projects, potentially. Um, and our members are among the most diverse, not only demographically, but also in the work they do. And we run a range of everything from highway, water work, we build uh, energy infrastructure, uh, disaster response, you name it. Um, we, our members are covered and trained in that work. Uh, we represent those members in the United States and Canada, and we have training operations in pretty much every state of the union. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda. And I work for an organization called FHI 360, which probably in this room, uh, many of you don't know about us. Uh, we are an organization that really focuses on the 360 degree approach to improving lives. So we are 4,000 uh, employees strong. We're uh, in 60 different countries. And we focus on different projects that look at democracy, uh, environment, health, education, uh, wellness. I work uh, in a department called uh, the National Institute for Work and Learning, and we focus specifically on uh, college and career readiness and workforce development issues. Great, thank you so much, Amanda. Molly? Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Molly Boucher, uh, and I certainly hope that you've heard of the Department of Labor before, but if you haven't, I can almost assure you that the Employment and Training Administration has intersected with your life in some way, shape, or form most likely with your work, but let's see. Uh, so you may be familiar with uh, ETA for short. Apologies, I can't help with the acronyms. They just, we happen to make everything about 32 words long, and so it just helps. Uh, but with ETA, uh, it touches everything, again, from unemployment insurance to the public workforce system and um, the formula funding that makes uh, that uh, program go, and that makes that uh, American Job Centers that you may be familiar with in your backyard. Uh, there may be job core centers, there may be youth build programs that you're familiar with. I would sincerely hope so in this room. <laughs> uh, and those are some of the uh, programs that ETA is responsible for, is leading, is offering the technical assistance to across the nation, uh, and I think is where uh, you all may find those connections. My work intersects with a number of these things. I uh, just said earlier during our brief conversation, I may uh, wear many hats. I'm sort of the hat rack of our front office in ETA. <laughs> so I uh, am eager to join you all in conversation. Thanks so much, Molly. Vanessa? Thanks, hi everybody. Uh, so Jobs for the Future is a national nonprofit intermediary and we uh, work at kind of the intersection of workforce and education. And we're really focused on building programs, practices, pathways, and policies that support all workers and learners in accessing economic mobility. Um, there's a lot that JFF does. I'll talk specifically about the Center for Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning, since that's where I sit. Um, we do all things apprenticeship and work-based learning. Uh, and a lot of that is really focused on providing what we call technical assistance and coaching to help local communities, local partners, either build pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs or create high quality work-based learning activities. We work across stakeholder groups um, and we help with things like creating standards for your apprenticeship and getting that program registered in your state. We help with things like embedding DEIA into the development of your program. So things like understanding how to create a culture of belonging, understanding uh, data sovereignty. We also do a lot of work around connecting work-based learning and apprenticeship to kind of the larger economic development system and helping stakeholders uh, convene around sector strategies and practices that can create training programs that are mobile. Um, and what I mean when I say that is rather than somebody having to sort of be boxed into a single pathway, helping folks think about how those pathways intersect so that individuals can move more freely throughout the workforce system and adapt as their life evolves, as their goals evolve, um, and really kind of helping to bring together all of those players involved in doing that. 
Thanks so much, Vanessa. And you may say, why, Marie already introduced them, why did you do that? Because I want you to know who their organizations are because each of you may decide, oh, I really want to follow up with this person or I really think I, that they should be added to our partnership list. I wanted you to get on a first name basis with them so that if you feel like they could add value to your program, you feel comfortable reaching out to them. Now, the other thing is, don't think you're gonna get in there and get the after lunch malaise. Uh, I know it says that we always wait for questions till the end. I never do that because you run out of time. So if you have a burning question while someone's talking, raise your hand and we'll recognize you. This is about getting you the information from these amazing experts that you need, not about being polite. So yell out, raise your hand, do whatever if you have a question. So Marie used that term Climate ready jobs. Sounds a little bit like the great quit or whatever that was called. You know, like they, people put these phrases together. Are they green jobs? Are they this job? Are they environmentally friendly job? What are they? So I'm going to go to you first, Molly. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? And did DOL have any role in creating that phrase? Yeah. I love this question because I love starting with a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Glad to help. Uh, so the interesting thing here, and perhaps the frustrating thing as well, is that climate-ready workforce, climate-ready jobs can tend to have a different definition based on the room that you're in and based on the conversation and who's speaking. Um, it seems like sector by sector or organization by organization, there's a different preference or understanding of who, what, how, what are the different job um, tenants or competencies or even formation of a job and how does it exist now and how do we retrofit or nudge it in a direction of being quote unquote green, being uh, climate ready, making it ecological in some way, shape or form. And the interesting thing here, and again, possibly the frustrating thing, is that the Department of Labor and a lot of our other federal partners, as we're continuing to have this conversation, not only amongst ourselves, but also with stakeholders like you all, we're very much in learning and listening mode. The, the fact happens to be that even when you see this in funding announcements or as the government may be putting out um, any number of guidance documents or you know I'm sure the, the super fun documents that you read to put you to sleep every evening, the question is still out there and the conversation is still very much live. There isn't something that has been the stamp of approval of this is the sole way that this needs to be articulated. And frankly, um, I really appreciate you, Jane, saying you know we want to hear questions because We'd really like to hear from you all how you all would like to define this and how you all, if you, as you're doing this work day by day, what does it make, how does it make sense to roll that back up to the federal level to talk about guidance, to talk about pathways and solidify something that makes sense, not necessarily in an academic or research focus, but what makes sense on the ground? What makes sense to make sure that young people and people who are already in these jobs make sure that we're articulating this in a way that is re representative of their experience. So um, in response to your hard question, uh, we want to have the conversation with you all. Yeah, we're going to stay on this. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to, I'm going to move to you, Amanda, uh, and ask, you know, this terminology, is it the same as green jobs? Is it the same as environmentally friendly jobs? You know, what research has been done on it? Because I really want to, we're, and I'm going to come back to both of you after you talk, to say these folks are going to apply for grants where these, that phrase is used. Mm -hmm. How do they respond to that? So please, research and the terminology. So terminology and research, uh, we're very much in the learning stages as well. Uh, we, our organization has actually conducted some initial uh, look at when we say green jobs, how are we defining that? And for us, we're defining that as um, jobs that support environmental sustainability. So green jobs, you think about the things that right away come to mind, you know, solar panel installation, right? Uh, Retrofitting buildings. Um, we think about um, things like uh, conservation of land. Um, when we're talking about climate ready jobs, we define that more as like um, looking at how we can build a resilient, a resiliency to the cl changing climate and the changing nature. Um, and so we're thinking about, you know, a little bit different jobs for those. Um, as I said, we're just in the initial stages of that. We've already, we're looking at how we're defining that. Our next phase and where we're going now is that we're looking at what are the um, cutting edge jobs? Where are the jobs, what are employers looking for? 
um, in the next five to 10 years. And then we're going to back, back map those to say, okay, if employers want these jobs, what are the skill requirements that employers are, are requiring for those entry level jobs? And then what can our programs, like AmeriCorps, uh, Conservation Corps, what can they do currently in their programs to help young people be able to transition into that pathway of those jobs? So. I think that's helpful. I don't know how you feel, but I mean, I think when you hear that term in a grant, uh, we all know about sorting software when you put in a job application, and if you don't have the right word, you don't get moved forward. Mm -hmm. Much of that is similar in, in the sausage resumes. making that is giving grants. <coughs> so, I mean, are there things that people should avoid, and I'm coming to you next, Kevin, but uh, <laughs> are there things, in your opinion, um, Molly and Amanda, are there things that people should put in a grant that talks about these jobs as, as climate ready mm -hmm. or words that they should avoid? Uh, less about what to avoid, but I think the focus is, again, that sustainability, mitigation, resilience, and thinking about what is the, the sort of growth in how, and uh, I will say, uh, when we've talked to other departments, you know, maybe they uh, don't necessarily like anecdotes. Department of Labor likes anecdotes. Uh, in our grant applications and how you talk about um, your programming and what is the story that creates that end result of that sustainability, resilience, et cetera. That's what we like to hear and I think that is uh, the open opportunity for you all to make the case for how and why and maybe something that's not uh, traditionally thought of as climate ready, maybe not traditionally thought of as green. How can you make the case for how this ecosystem is building and sort of broadening uh, to maybe non-traditional sectors. Um, and that's uh, something that we're looking for. And Great. I Amanda, would just I continue think. on uh, mm -hmm. from what you said and really thinking about the pathways yes. as well. Um, it's To us, it's not so much uh, about the actual entry level job, it's really about the pathway. And when a young person or somebody uh, re-entering the workforce comes in, um, how can we get them to the next level so that they can level up mm -hmm. and move from an entry level job into a, uh, a, broader, a broader job or a career pathway? So for us, it's about, you know, okay, if we're applying for this grant and we're providing this training, this is what they may be able to do after that. Mm -hmm. Great. So Kevin, everybody knows what a laborer is and the majority of your members, if not all of them, are the visual that they would get how do climate-ready jobs fit into that? I mean, what's greening about construction right now? Right. Well, I think that the um, we look at the construction sector, and, and climate resilience is about actions, construction that is going to feed in one of two things. It's either mitigation or adaptation. And not to be flip, but you know, climate change is good for construction. I mean, it's a lot of work. That Glad it's good done. for somebody. <laughs> um, Mitigation is really just undoing, you know, or, or, or lowering the harm we're doing, and that's largely going to be atmospheric, you know, carbon. So uh, energy uh, production is going to be the primary producer of carbon, or it has been. So renewables is the biggest sector there, obviously. Um, the EV transition for automobiles is trying to take that carbon out of the transportation system. And what I think folks don't appreciate is EV is not just buying your, you know, your plug-in car and having a new charger. You have to mine lithium that goes into the batteries, build the batteries in a battery factory, have battery uh, recycling facilities on the other end of it. Like the entire supply chain has to be redone. It's all construction. Um, there's also other sectors. Building is a lot more movement toward uh, energy efficiency, building uh, structures, environments. I know that familiar, that's familiar with uh, for some folks. And then even in the water, there's a little bit, you know, a, Lead service line removals are is a big sector we're focused on right now. There's a lot of contaminants in uh, in the last remaining lines that were never replaced in, in uh, home uh, water systems. So all of that is one side. And then the adaptation, which you don't even normally think about, is you know Army Corps of Engineer has to control the water. The flooding is is seawalls, dam, new canal building, uh, wetland restoration. Right now in the Everglades, they're preparing to do over a billion dollars of construction and Everglades restoration under the Army Corps of Engineers. So the water systems, I think, is a lot where the adaptation's coming in, air in the, in the mitigation, but that's all construction. We're training for each of those different sectors. Uh, and then in addition to the, the just the training of it, it's, there's a lot of heat 
sensitivity. Our members have to be aware, um, and you should be aware in going out. There's a whole new world out there where it's hitting 100 degrees for far more days of the year, and it's very difficult to do the construction in the areas where it needs to get done. So we're building entire modules around that. And then, uh, you know, I think just as an anecdote about how extensive the laborers' work has been in this is, and Jenna, you'll appreciate this. So our, our folks, California was ahead of the game and built their renewables uh, out in the utility scale renewables in the desert 10 years ago. Most of, almost all of it was union. The laborers are responsible because the desert's not just sand. The desert tortoise has to be taken care of when they build those. And so the laborers are responsible for making sure those folks, that, that the tortoises that were disrupted have temporary habitats, and then they had to build right-of-ways so that they could move around the construction sites without being hurt by the vehicles and that sort of thing. So all of it is potentially good laborers' work. Well, that, and that's important to see those connections, but I don't see any, oh, I see a hand. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I'm from Miami. Oh, you can you know a little bit about climate change? <laughs> <laughs> the next Venice. You have a unit down there um, that's in Pompano Beach. How would you suggest that the core in our area, in South Florida, connect with those people over there at Laona? Andre has been a friend of mine for a whole lot of years, but I'm not quite sure if they have any active apprenticeship programs or if they've been able to engage in a labor peace agreement to get that work done. Because many times I found that I've been in a labor movement all of my adult life, and I'm kind of old right now. Sister. But, um, they seem to want to skirt around what we have to offer because somebody's offering something a little less. So if you would not mind, if you can give me a direct connect in South Florida so that maybe we can, from the Greater Miami Service Corps, establish some kind of apprenticeship program maybe with the La Una organization that's down there. Al Houston was a personal friend of mine, God rest his soul. Yep. So I do know he that he brother. and Joe Caleb did a lot of work in yes, that yeah. area. And it seems to have been by your international a little dismantled. I just got to keep it 100. <laughs> <laughs> good well, good thing to bring so up, you have the guy here. And you know what? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, sister. And so I 100%, and, so because of the work that we did with this administration also, that, the, that Army Corps work is going to have a project labor agreement requirement. That work is gonna be done under an agreement and that's the avenue where we can connect on that and get folks into those jobs. So thank you so much. Sir. Uh, that's you. Can I, can I speak? I yes. <laughs> oh, you, there's, someone's running to you with the mic. I've made life miserable for my friends at the Corps Network, I'm sorry. Sure. Not uh, anything new. My name is Chris Litzo. I'm with the Great Lakes Community Conservation Corps, Great Lakes CCC. Um, so we heard Jenna talk about her PhD research, and, and it was really made possible because she saw that, whatever, I'm not sure what you call that spec. Uh, in any case, it gets to the higher the quality of the experiential learning experience that the core can provide, the vast the more open things become, right? We also know that the unions are great. They provide, they have the best training, they provide outstanding, the journeyman has hours and hours and hours and hours, right? My question is, prior to, and what piggybacking on what Levetta was saying is, prior to becoming an apprentice, how about the pre-apprentice? So um, where do we get, the unions are on those cutting edge projects. But if I'm not an apprentice, and I'm not sure I want to be an apprentice, how do I kick the tires as a pre-apprentice? Thoughts? Kevin, maybe I'll give you a minute to think and bring Vanessa in on this, because that's really what JFF is doing at the center. They're not just doing, just. They're not only doing uh, apprenticeships, they're doing work-based learning. Do you want to uh, weigh in on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, I think pre-apprenticeship is a really phenomenal vehicle for getting people into work and education. And I'm gonna say work and education because anecdotally, it, we find most pre-apprentices get 
uh, the career exploration and mentorship of a pre-apprenticeship and don't choose to go into a registered apprenticeship. Not always the case, and many do follow that pathway, but they walk out of a pre-apprenticeship with technical skills, employability skills, a credential, and navigation support in the career system so that they actually find employment either in the labor market or they choose to follow a post-secondary pathway. Um, and I think for core programs, the work you're doing you are already in so many ways providing a pre-apprenticeship experience. You are providing supportive services, you have robust networks of partners, you are focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, you're working with employers to align your training and make sure that what you're providing to an individual resonates with their needs, and you are actively working to facilitate connections between your training and an employment opportunity. I'm pretty sure, Molly, I got all six of DOL's characteristics in that summary, but you tell me if I forgot one. Without taking a breath, very good. But, I, um, I, yeah. but you guys are doing that work, and I think it's a real kind of sweet spot for you all to help prepare young people for the world of registered apprenticeship, because to your point, it can be a lot of hours of training. It can be quite rigorous, and giving them exposure to what that might be like before they make a full-time commitment, I think is really important. I do want to also flag, there are phenomenal registered apprenticeships within the union system, but apprenticeship has grown exponentially in the last 15 years. Something like between 2016 and 2021, 14,000 new apprenticeship programs were created, 390,000 individuals completed apprenticeship training, and in the 10 years from prior to that, 22 million new apprentices participated in the system. There's been really, really historic investment in apprenticeship, and so I think these programs, union and non-union, are looking for partnerships and relationships with training providers, with programs like yours that can help support young people in becoming the future apprentices in their programs. Um, and there's a lot of great stuff happening in the climate space, not just through construction and sort of our more traditional industries, but things like agriculture and aquaculture and farming and, and all kinds of great things. Mm -hmm. So Kevin, I want to give you a chance to respond to Chris's question as well. I took you off the spot for a minute because I felt like I was ignoring Vanessa and I knew she'd have great <laughs> expertise there. But Absolutely. are you at LIUNA uh, partnering with any pre-apprenticeship programs? And either if not or if you're not aware of any, what advice would you give CORE's to do with their local LIUNA uh, union offices to get connected and to make sure that the experiences they're doing lean into what you, you expect of right. a new hire. Because right. I use the word registered apprenticeship because I've used it my whole life. But the reason that I say this is because people sometimes use the word apprentice incorrectly. They use it as a synonym for intern. Mm -hmm. A registered apprentice is a, an employee from day one. And in my opinion, anybody who uses the term apprentice should have that same thing. So day one, you have all the rights and responsibilities of an employee, not like an intern. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you're giving me an opportunity to brag a little bit on the work that we've been doing with the cores. Um, so I, readiness and retention are the biggest problem right now for we've now hit the skids. All the members that we used to have on the bench who were waiting for jobs, that's it. So now it's about finding new folks. And when you pull in folks to the industry, it's a struggle. That's the part that cores do a lot of them really well, right? To actually build that kind of readiness, the job readiness, and give them support. And that's not what we're focused on. Like our, our employers are focused on these folks need to be trained. We represent them, make sure they're safe on the job, and have support on the job. So that marriage is, is perfectly lined up, and the question is how to do it. So the, the, what we've been doing in Baltimore, with my local, I'm also the secretary treasurer of the Baltimore local uh, for laborers, um, we've been working with uh, the core there, Civic Works, and lining up their pre-apprenticeship into the apprenticeship program, and are collaborating under a grant, and actually going to be trying to organize some work uh, that'll get those folks into EV charging under that the state is doing, among others. And really, it's about lining up the, the conversation with the training folks on the union side and the program development on the core side. Because what we've been able to figure out is if we can get alignment on what kind of skills are being trained in, in the pre-apprenticeship side, you can get credit in the registered apprenticeship. So you come in with 500 hours, that means you're getting paid more from day one in the registered apprenticeship. 
because apprentices start at a partial wage and move up as they uh, get more time on the job. So it's a real advantage for, for folks to, to do that partnership for us because we're getting uh, a highly successful candidates and for the core graduates because they're gonna automatically walk into a, an employer-related job under a collective bargaining agreement and graduate to a full wage uh, in a shorter period of time. So we're, we're really like to, hopefully this pilot works very well and we'll be able to expand it other places. Kevin, can I ask you? Yeah, that'd be great. Where are you going out again? Baltimore. That's in Baltimore right now. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, they wear rich, oh, it's you. <laughs> I was like. I want to ask a question and I hate to be crass. But just so everybody knows, on average, what does a starting worker that's a member of LIUNA make? It really depends on the market. Um, Give me a high-low. Uh, a journey worker laborer can make 35, 40 plus benefits, mm -hmm. plus health care, pension, et cetera, uh, in good markets. Uh, there's also markets where they might be starting at 18, 19, 20 dollars an hour. Uh, certainly, those are the ones we're trying to pull up. Those are where we don't have as many market, uh, as many contractors don't control as much of the market. Uh, but in Chicago, I think we're probably more in the 40s. Um, so an hour. An hour, and that's that's on the check. That's not benefits. And they're working 40 hours a week. Uh, it can. It really depends on projects. They can do 40 hours a week. There are some t certain projects where folks are very happy to work 10 six-hour days and make a lot of money very quickly and take two months off. Yeah, I asked the 40-hour question because, you know, with the, the increases in minimum wage, a lot of kids are working in things like fast food, making $15, $18, $20 an hour, but they work 10 hours a week, right. you know, and they have no benefits. So that's why I wanted to really push this. Again, the wages vary a little bit, but thank you for that. So you need to keep that in mind. Why this instead of something else where your core members are moving. All right, Molly, I'm going to ask you another hard question because ETA to ETA here, you know, even though mine was when the dinosaurs roamed the earth in the Obama administration, are there currently or on the horizon opportunities for core members uh, to compete for money at DOL? I think there's a pretty pressing uh, need to develop uh, those muscles so that uh, we have the clear connections, not only between everyone in this room uh, and DOL, but also between everyone in this room, DOL, uh, laborers, and really everyone working in this same space. There's a lot of the same conversations going on, but we're not necessarily speaking the same language. I think right now, there's certainly opportunities that you all could be eligible for now and that we put out on an annual basis, and you may be engaged through your current network already. Uh, but there's, to make sure that those connections are going to be stronger, to make sure that those connections are going to go into, like we've just talked about, really quality career pathways, the pre-apprenticeships, the registered apprenticeships, there is some work that we still need to do. And the work is uh, definitely on the DOL side, uh, but we definitely want to hear from you all as well about how we're articulating those competencies and those experiences that you all are providing to young people so that we can make those crosswalks uh, and really, again, tell the story of how the work that you're doing on the ground makes the case, makes those, um, uh, makes the equivalency for that pre-apprenticeship and lays that on-ramp for registered apprenticeship and other high-quality pathways. Because as soon as we find that information, as soon as we put that to paper, the opportunity for funding opportunities uh, or the opportunity to apply for DOL dollars really just opens all the way up. Uh, like you said, there's been a massive influx in the amount of uh, apprenticeship dollars that the department has been putting out there. As soon as we can work with you all to talk about what your programs are delivering uh, and how that connects to these good quality pathways and how we make sure that that's a seamless transition, that we're speaking the same language, there's huge opportunity for not only those funds, but again, that, uh, that broader connection to apprenticeship, to youth build, to Job Corps and the partnerships that are already happening on the ground and articulating that uh, into broader opportunity and honestly just dollars to make sure that folks are connecting to good quality jobs. Shane, can I also sure. add, because I, um, I think that's 
so important to know. And there's also money that DOL's already got active in the system right now that you could be able to tap into. So state apprenticeship expansion dollars go down to states, their formula funding that allows states to build out their apprenticeship systems and infrastructure. A lot of times they're looking for training providers to partner with, uh, working with your local workforce board to get on the eligible training provider list if you're not already on it. That's a great way of vetting the quality of your program with employers in the community. You have organizations like JFF that function as industry intermediaries, and that means that we are contracted with the Department of Labor to support the creation and expansion of apprenticeship programs in specific industries. JFF is focused on manufacturing and agriculture. Our friends at IREC are focused on clean energy. That means we often have incentives funding that we can connect to you or to your employers to help offset some of the expenses that might come with creating an apprenticeship program. Um, and then there's a lot of grant programs that organizations like JFF have that can provide capacity building dollars and access to peer learning networks to help you build curricula or again, register a program and develop standards and all of that good stuff. So there's both future money to come, but there are active dollars out there. Um, and your state office of apprenticeship your local workforce board, and your intermediary friends, uh, we're folks to talk to who can help plug you into those dollars. And we don't have them represented on the uh, panel today, but somehow the Department of Commerce got all the big money and not the Department of Labor uh, in the last two years. But if you're not connected with your local Department of Commerce office, your regional office, you should, because that's the CHIPS Act, that's the infrastructure, that's billions it dwarfs everybody's budget. Mm -hmm. So you should definitely be reaching out and maybe we can talk the core network into getting Rachel Lipson or somebody from that Don Grave, somebody on, on a webinar so you know about what their money is. The, you know, the hydrogen hubs, there's huge money out there and all of it involves a drastic increase in the need for entry level labor. All right, so I'm, I'm coming to you and I, I hope you don't mind Molly. Uh, asking you a question yes. again about um, where people can get information about grant funds from labor. Is there a website that they should keep on their tickler file? Oh, sure. Uh, well, I'll say maybe the best place to go to is Workforce GPS uh, for all of our uh, issued technical assistance. We have webinars that tell you how to access upcoming funding, when things will be coming available, and also what I think is going to be most helpful examples of who has previously received funding, how, and we have those conversations with actual grantees that are, again, posted to webinars, and that's all information that you can see. So again, for things like pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship funding, those are the specific stories that we have been able to share and that we've uplifted of different organizations, different partnerships, different ways that locals have formed those connections to gain access to Department of Labor funding for capacity building, for the day-to-day -to, -day to make their programs run. Uh, I'll also note uh, we have our dol.gov slash grants page, fairly simple. Uh, you can see all of our available grants, uh, and also we have a sort of look ahead prospectus that tells you what's coming. DOL is not necessarily too innovative in the way, in the times that we post our, our funding availability. We have the same roughly uh, announcements that come every year, right about the same time spring or winter uh, or fall, so you can start to build that into your planning. If you've seen an announcement go in spring of 2022, it's probably gonna go again in spring of 2023, it's probably gonna go again in spring of 2024. If you haven't seen it yet, it's coming immediately. You know, you can start to plan that cadence, and if you missed it this time around, there's room to build uh, your partnerships, build uh, that coalition that's going to make you um, a more successful applicant moving forward when you know it's coming around again. So uh, I wanna encourage you to take a look at both of those things. And again, uh, build in those partnerships and take a look at uh, also examples of other organizations that might mirror your own uh, and take note. So Amanda, I wanna torment you for a second on this. Yes. You know, the whole world is talking about skills-based hiring, mm -hmm. right? Some people are talking mm -hmm. about competency-based education as well, but let's talk about skills-based hiring. How can these incredible people that are running these cores better articulate the skills that their participants are learning 
and kind of connect them to skills that are necessary for some of the in-demand jobs that are out there? What, what has your research shown about that and what advice could you give them? I, I would um, encourage uh, all of you to really think about uh, what your current training offerings are um, I'm gonna go a little off script. Uh, yeah, no, no, so, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, I am a proud uh, AmeriCorps mom. Uh, huh? So uh, I had a, my middle child went through uh, two years of service working with Conservation Corps in Utah. I think Utah's here and in Washington State. Um, wow. And uh, they are now working for the US Forestry Service. So when you talk about career um, progressions and career pathways, you know, that was a, a child who didn't go to college and he, uh, just wanted to be outside and so didn't know what he wanted to do and what did what did your programs do they gave they gave him um, you know a pre-apprenticeship type model where he could explore and think and learn um, but what I would encourage you to do is to think about that training piece as we're shifting now more towards career pathways and that language in your grants is going to become stronger really think about you know okay if I'm offering a soy of Sawyer uh, A level, right? Should we be doing maybe a B level for our, for our um, members? Um, is there other certifications that we can provide them that when they put it on their resume um, for the next position, that it will earn them the, the higher salary when they get there? Um, so those are some things I would like you to think about is like what, are our, what is our current training and how could we just sort of turn up the volume on it a little bit um, to provide uh, even more experiences for our young people. How many of you are already offering an industry recognized credential as part of your program? It looks like most uh, about yeah. Half, yeah, half. Uh, uh, half or more. I think that's really smart and really smart because it does make a difference on a resume if mm -hmm. you have an industry recognized credential. Even if it's, I don't, I keep saying it's like it's a little, an OSHA 10 or an OSHA 30. You know, yeah. I mean, you're telling yeah. people that you know about safety because mm -hmm. you've earned those credentials. I think that's quite important. All right, Kevin, I want to, I want to stay on this line of thinking. And you know, I really appreciated the, the comments and questions because I think it's important to think about um, partnering with LIUNA because you have so much need. And we do want to help you get to a million members. But could you give them an idea of what skills you think are really important to have in a pre-apprenticeship program? Sure, I think the, uh, I mean, you did say, right, the OSHA 10 is, that's a deal breaker. You can't get on most jobs with at least an OSHA 10 and OSHA 30 is much better. Uh, where you get able to deliver that sort of thing. I think, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, for laborers, a lot of the construction skills can be learned very quickly on the job and with, with some quick training from a journey worker. It is really the showing up at 5.30 a.m. every day to bust your rear end uh, for the whole day that's the challenge. That's not for everybody. And it's a very difficult thing to uh, understand if you don't have a little bit of exposure ahead of time. That's where cores really are able to suss out who actually has the inclination to do that kind of work, who, who really wants to drive and really likes the teamwork of a, a construction site, uh, has the maturity to handle you know, getting yelled at sometimes. Uh, this is, it, it is a challenging environment, and I think that the preparedness for that is probably more important than even any hands-on skill, because that can, that can come very quickly on the job with the, with the trainers. And how about teamwork? Important in your 100%, line of work? 100%. Absolutely. There couldn't be anything more important. You have to be able to work with people, including people you may not even like that much, uh, but you have to stay safe and work in harmony uh, to get the job done and stay on that job. Uh, that those things are the soft skills that are being taught that I've seen taught at Civic Works uh, in those classes, you know, absolutely invaluable. Yeah, especially if you're the only one. You know, you're the only woman, you're the only person of 100%. color, you're the only 19 year old. I mean, yep. that's re how, how many of us have been the only in a room during our careers? And it's painful. I mean, it really yeah. is painful. So, how do you teach kids the resilience that don't be, don't be afraid if you're the only? You're, you're breaking ground by yeah. being the only. Yeah. And that's really a hard lesson. But I think that's important. Now, you're not asking any questions, and I don't know whether you've fallen asleep. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Jackie's got one. You know, it's Hi. very hard for me to see over there. It's Sorry. Mary Ellen. Hi, um, Mary Ellen with the Core Network. Um, we've kind of hit on a number of pieces of kind of where I would like to go. 
We know that CORES are really effective work preparation programs and supportive services. We, we see the results. I like to think that CORES are sort of the original green job or climate ready um, training ground for young people. CORES are looking at certificates and pre-apprenticeships and we've worked with a number of you to get some of those conversations going, but it's been a little bit hit or miss. I'm wondering if the American Climate Corps has, uh, provides an opportunity for us to do something kind of industry-wide, to recognize skill sets that all cores are offering, but then also give opportunities for young people to go different directions based on their particular interests and skill sets. It just seems like this is a great opportunity. We've kind of talked about this for a while. We know that cores are preparing young people, and we would like for all of our core members, 25,000 a year, to leave their core experience with something of value in the workforce. That means an employer can say, oh yeah, core member, they, they know this, this, and this. I feel good about hiring them. Is this an opportunity for us to do something um, that has meaning for all core members? And I would put, put that to the whole panel. Yeah, I mean, Molly, are there opportunities to develop a, a, a customized credential that would be mm -hmm. unique to the core? There's definitely the opportunity, and I think I maybe alluded to this, maybe inarticulately, but I think there's the opportunity, again, to capture what you all are already doing and roll that up into something that certifies you know, knowledge, that certifies competency, that certifies that the individuals going through your training programs, going through your experiential learning opportunities, that they have XYZ competencies that certify them to go into this next step, to allow them to transition into, again, that job or that educational opportunity, whatever that next step is that makes sense for them. Um, it really just is that uh, the imperative, the onus is on, uh, I think, us, maybe mostly us on the dais uh, and not just in the room uh, to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, Amanda and Vanessa, any opportunity for you to give some technical assistance in that space? I don't like putting you on the spot, but that, yeah. we're only, we're only going to do this for an hour. Right. But is there, because for, for folks, look, they have two jobs running mm -hmm. a, a local core. I mean, it's, it's caring and worrying about their participants. It's raising money. It's getting jobs. I can't imagine how they do it. I have such respect for them. But if they could get some technical assistance in exactly what they need it to do, to kind of get to that level of these are the things that we're doing already, these are the things that we could stretch and do. What do you think about technical assistance? Um, absolutely. Um, that One of our big missions uh, is to really provide technical assistance to local communities because we know that um, you know, you're trying to do your, your member training, but then you also have to remember you have to train your team members, right? And so really thinking about how that navigator training happens as well. Um, you know, our organization, FHI 360, has uh, digital badges that you can pick off the shelf and, and use and implement. We have e-modules that you can give to, um, to give to your members that they have to complete within six months. Um, all around those soft skills uh, that employers are saying that they want, um, but also that mapping piece and really thinking about how you can map the, what you're providing and how to articulate, help a young person articulate it on a resume is the, also the other important part. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, that's exactly what JFF does, right? Our role as an intermediary yeah. is to provide coaching and TA to partners to help them do this work um, and to provide capacity to, to help you sustain the work over time. Um, I think, you know, there's a real opportunity as kind of climate as a sector comes to fruition, becomes more defined to be thinking about career pathways again as these sort of fluid intersected opportunities where people can move not just up a career ladder but across career ladders. Um, and something I, I want to also just flag in addition to the fact that we can provide free technical assistance, we can again provide funding as well, is that a lot of our work is also with the employers that you are working with to help them understand how they need to change. Because the reality is that a lot of employers have been operating the way they've always been operating, and our future workforce, young people, they're looking for something different. They are emboldened and impassioned by the work that they are doing. They want a job that does not just 
resonate with them, but where they show up and they feel like they belong, they feel like they are respected, and they feel supported in their long-term journey. And that is taking a bit of a culture shift with industry and with employers. And so that's work that we can help you with as well, kind of helping you not just build training and curriculum and showcase everything that you're providing to a participant and how you're a good partner, but helping you have those conversations and navigate that dynamic with employers who need to come along that journey of change as well. I hear offers here. Don't let them out of the room without their information. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to go to Kevin last, and then I know I have a couple more questions here. And just let my friends at the, the core network know my clock has stopped. So you have to physically stop me, or I'll keep going till midnight. Um, when's the right time, Kevin? So they're going to get the technical assistance they need to kind of work on a credential. When's the right time to bring an employer in? Like, do they wait till the credentials cooked and come to you and say, how about this? Do they talk to you during the process? What do you think? Uh, yes, early, early and often. Um, and so, just to be clear, we are not technically employees, right? We're the labor. Right. We represent the labor, the labor folks who are then employed with our signatory contractors. But that intermediary role is really important because our training uh, organizations in general are multi-employer. So the entire construction sector in that area will be working with us uh, to establish curriculum, the kind of training skills, and so forth for that, that apprenticeship program. So lining it up with those folks links you to all of the employers and making sure you understand what the expectations are for coming into an apprenticeship, uh, that's a communication process. And as we've learned do doing this, it takes a while to make sure that everybody's talking the same language, the expectations of both sides are real and met, uh, and that there's accountability and, and timelines with people who are very busy. So understanding how busy everybody is on both sides, the earlier that communication can start, and work your way toward a goal, the better. Great. Some of the, you had questions. Sir. Jerry Ingersoll, Forest Service Job Corps, and a proud partner with ETA and Department of Labor in, in running civilian conservation centers that are, that are Job Corps centers. And I want to touch on something Vanessa said there, which is many of our students want to give back, want to serve, mm -hmm. want to go on and participate in NGO or public sector jobs. And some of the ways that we evaluate success at Job Corps centers and at cores is the salary that we pay a graduate or the salary, and, and we want all of our graduates to be able to support themselves and there's sometimes a tension in that evaluation. You can make more money as a welder, and good for you, and you could become a conservation worker and maybe not make quite as much money, especially at the start, but maybe have a chance to serve in something that matters to you. How do we address that tension, particularly as we get into green jobs and climate-related work? Thanks. Thoughts? So you go ahead, Molly. Okay. Um, one thing I will say is um, you're right. Uh, there is a definite tension there. Uh, and there's something to be said for what our WIOA metrics are uh, and how we have to report. Um, that presently is just a, a fact of how the system is designed right now. But at the same time, you're entirely right that we should be ideally and ultimately encouraging young people to travel along the paths that are fulfilling for them. And at the same time, we need those paths to be also economically sustaining. We need those to be able to support the individual, support the family that they may be supporting or may want to uh, expand in the future. Uh, that's also a reality and something that is uh, a tension which you've rightly acknowledged. Um, it's something that I will say we're hoping to address, um, maybe you all saw recently, um, again, with this sort of broader uh, effort to encourage registered apprenticeship, encourage good quality pathways. Uh, there was a recent uh, executive order that was issued specifically to do that with encouraging registered apprenticeship in um, the government, in public sector, with, I think, in one sense, the intention to create those good quality pathways that can allow young people like you're talking about at these uh, conservation cores to move along a pathway that is fulfilling, but again, into a job that is going to be good quality. Um, and maybe in uh, the federal service or you know, in some aligned uh, 
position that's going to, again, fulfill them, but also sustain them economically and allow them to travel along a pathway well uh, and not uh, on a sort of shoestring budget. Yeah, and I think I would also add, um, you know, we have some work to do, I think, as a country around minimum wage. That is just a fact. Um, I, I was born and raised in New Hampshire. The minimum wage I made at 15 is the minimum wage there today. I'm 35 now, so that's, that's a problem. Um, I think also we're in this moment of a, a big conversation around job quality, which is so important, but I'm always mindful of how we talk about job quality and how we may unintentionally dismiss really important jobs. I think about this a lot with um, certified nursing assistants, for example. The conversation is always to upskill out of that job, but that is a very essential job in our healthcare system. That's a job that provides meaningful support to patients, but also to their families and caregivers. And that's a job in which people feel a tremendous sense of pride. And so I think we need to be doing state advocacy and national advocacy around the minimum wage, and we need to also be elevating in the spaces that we hold with the partners we sit with the importance of these other jobs, right? That it is not just wages, but wages are important and wages need to come up to make those, those jobs equitable and accessible. Yeah, and I just wanna add, I, Molly doesn't need me to defend the, the Department of Labor, but uh, remember all the programs that we care about are funded by Congress. Yeah. And both houses, both sides of the aisle, this is not a political statement, look at ROI. So they put a dollar into these programs. They want to make sure the kids that are in these programs get, and by the way, in many of these programs, they put a lot more than a dollar a kid. But they, they want to make sure the kid is doing better at the end of the program than they would have done if they hadn't attended the program. So while I agree with you that wages don't always match passion, we have to figure out a way to fix that because they will zero you out. I mean, how many times have they zeroed out Job Corps? you know, four while I was at labor, right? So, I mean, I think, I think we, we, we need to remember the reality that they don't fund things that they think are charity programs and they want to make sure they're working. So I saw other questions here. Yes, sir. Well, I have three, so you might want to go first. <laughs> you sure? You have time. You have time. I have one question. So we're standing up our first uh, crew, to finishing up training today in Michigan uh, as weatherization, weatherization crew. Um, and there's a big investment in that. We're working with our community action agency who came to us to help get this started, as well as a union and a, a union, uh, the union carpenters in Michigan, and then also uh, uh, Clark Construction, which is a major construction company around the, co around the country. And uh, my, my question is, it's all gonna go great. I can tell it's gonna go great. But for that crew, it costs us $20,000 just to get up the equipment we need to be able to go out and do the weatherization, which we had to raise through a donor. And I'm wondering, where do we access funds to buy a $12,000 blown insulation machine, a trailer, hand tools, PPE, and other equipment that we need to field crews? I walked into Wayne County, which is Detroit, Southeast Michigan, and told them about what we were doing. And Wayne County said, can you have 20 crews ready for us next week? And I don't think they were kidding, right? Um, and I know that we're not going to get anywhere near that, but how do I access the funding to pay for the machinery we need to do the work? You know, I got a 35 chainsaws, but that isn't going to help me do this. That's all. Thanks. Any ideas on funding for that kind of stuff? Philanthropy is the fastest and easiest. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the Bomber Group is in Southeast Michigan, and they're pretty generous. Which group? Bomber, Steve Bomber, B-A-L-L-M-E-R. You guys phone <laughs> <laughs> I can get it for you. Just for reference, Steve Bomber has the same amount of money as Bill Gates, 111 billion. Steve Bomber has the same amount of money as Bill Gates. He's the co-founder of... Microsoft. Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Southeastern Michigan, yeah. the three counties. Um, I'll also say it's, this is, again, where I think partnerships with your local workforce development boards and workforce systems are really critical because they have access to a lot of employment and training dollars. They can help you kind of discern what can be used to purchase equipment, what are allowable costs. But also, if you're providing or can frame your program, which you all should be able to, as high-quality work-based learning experiences, 
if there's some sort of a connection to a secondary education program, which I think some of you have, there could be some Perkins funding as well that can help you to, to pay for equipment. Your community college partners might have funding as well. So braiding and blending funding, especially for things like this, I think is really where those partners are, are essential. I was just going to say get the carpenters to pay for it. <laughs> oh, spoken like a true Lyuna person. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Yeah. Hey, I'm glad I thought. David uh, from Long Beach, California. I'm one of the local conservation corps uh, in California. Um, I'd like to connect with you or your team at JFF. We're connected through a spectrum partnership locally. Um, we really struggle to partner with our local workforce investment board because we're seen as competition. So that's a real challenge for us. And when money flows through the web, it often doesn't come to us. It's a real, real challenge, but I'd love to tackle that on the side. As a very, so here are the three questions. Um, tackle them as many or as few or whatever order you like. The very next step, specifically on creating a national labor and industry recognized credential for completion in the program for an accredited ACC program, what that actually looks like. What is the immediate next step to start that process for accredited cores? One. The second question is, as a national lobbying association, a lot of the challenges that we experience with WIOA funding and why our core specifically does not go after much WIOA funding other local cores in California do, is that a lot of the guidelines do not align with youth tape focused programming, right? I know that there's youth WIOA and that it's different. Sure, we get maybe a year instead of six months. Um, what does, as a national DC-based lobbying association look like to start to actually change language around WIOA, and how do we tackle that as an association? The last one is just for fun for the TA providers. Have you seen gamification for our age group of goal attainment around career, you know, career progression, gamification, and sort of social networking to create motivational sort of community around this process, because I think that one of the things that we're missing is we operate under traditional models, um, and I think that, you know, surprisingly, if they could look more at their phone, even when they're with us, we might actually engage more, which sounds counterintuitive, but I think is actually the case. Have fun. So let me go, let me go down those in case, because I was taking notes. Um, what's the next step in really formalizing this credential language? How do you change the guidelines in WIOA? And my question to you would be, what's stopping you, regs or legislative language? Because legislative language, forget about it. It hasn't been reauthorized since 06. And I think it's 2024. Um, and the last one, have you seen anything on gamification? Um, I'll start with the last one. Um, since one good thing that came out of COVID <laughs> was the uh, shift in how we're teaching and learning, right? Um, there is tons of gamification things out there all around career readiness, especially for um, career awareness, career exploration, lots of AI kind of things that are happening now, AI tools that, you can, that kids can use, um, especially for the uh, younger high school kid age. Um, from for the 18 to 24 year olds, not so much, um, but those things, you know, you could look at and, and take, a, take a swipe at. Yeah, and I'll say we have worked with some community colleges that have yeah. tried testing out uh, VR as a way of doing some job training. So an example of this was we worked with a school that um, was granted some VR headsets and they were using that in a healthcare pathway to do um, like patient care tutorials and workshops. They were also kind of using it as a way to sort of um, explore some of like the phlebotomy skills, right? So not the actual act of it, but kind of how do you prep your sterile kits and all of that kind of thing. And the, and the whole goal was they were serving primarily rural workers and learners who couldn't get to the workplace um, on a regular basis. So this allowed them to get some of the on-the-job training while they were in the classroom. Um, and that has been, I think, very successful. And then I think gamification, I'm not super familiar with it, I'll be honest, but I think what I have heard from the field is that it can be tremendously valuable. I think it's about figuring out how you align that sort of modality with the training that's needed um, and making sure that it is actually helping somebody become quote unquote competent in whatever that skill is. Please thank the panel, Absolutely. they were great. Thank you so much.